I'm Jack Gilbert, Editor-in-Chief of M-Systems, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our second M-Systems Thinking webinar. Technological innovation fuels fundamental discoveries across scientific disciplines, and systems microbiology is no exception. Think how many advances have been made possible in the last 15 years since the introduction of next-gen sequencing technologies. Think how fast bioinformatics platforms have had to be forced to grow to cope with the vast troves of sequencing data. Even back in the lab, developments in genome editing, receptor ligand screening, and metabolomics are regularly revolutionizing our understanding in the microbial world. M-Systems is committed to publishing cutting-edge tools and techniques that help to support advances in basic science and translation to practice. Here, M-Systems brings together three innovative scientists, Anne Dicas, Lawrence David, and Manuel Libeke, who are all working on state-of-the-art technologies that will shape the future of systems microbiology. I hope you are looking forward to their lectures and the discussion as much as I am. Remember, ask questions. Our speakers are here in person and ready to answer them. Also, stick around for the end for a chance to meet the speakers face-to-face -face and ask those burning questions that you still have, or just introduce yourself to them and make a great connection. Let's get on with the show. It's my great pleasure to introduce Lawrence Davids. Lawrence is the Associate Director of the Duke Microbiome Center in Duke University. He did his PhD in Computational and System Biology at MIT, and his lab typically studies relationship between diets, the gut microbiome, and human health by engineering new tools at the interface of nutrition and microbiology. Today is going to present the new platform this lab, his lab developed, combining recent advances in droplet microfluidic and high throughput DNA sequencing. So without further ado, this is Lawrence David. Thanks for inviting me to talk, uh, Jean-Baptiste. I'm, uh, as uh, you introduced, Lawrence David. I'm an assistant professor at Duke University, and I'll be telling you today about work that our lab has been doing developing different kinds of genomic approaches for profiling uh, microbial communities in the human gut uh, and how they interface with diet. And I know it's uh, only a 20 minute talk and I'll, I'll be so bold as to try and still tell you about two methods that we've developed because I'm really interested or excited about both. And uh, I'm showing this um, background here on the title slide because one of them I think is really fun it's uh, inspired by collaborations with uh, ecologists who work in the field and who study lots of different kinds of animals and what they eat. And what one of the things that we've been doing over the past years is learning how to adapt their tools to what we do and what we study in humans. Okay, so we work at the interface of diet and the gut microbiome. Uh, we do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one has to do with, essentially, it seems like that there's an increasing body of evidence that the microbiome and uh, is strongly shaped by what we eat. Uh, you see evidence of this in large cohort studies that have been done by a number of groups, including ones looking at the effects of things like environment and, and host genetics, as well as, uh, or comparing those things. And, you know, when you look at how, uh, variation between gut microbial communities partitions in those cohorts. You see uh, what I'm highlighting here is that what people eat, particularly the amount of uh, things like vegetables or meat uh, pop out and are often strong signatures of um, microbiome variation. It's been seen too in the American Gut Project, um, which had over 10,000 people in it. One of the um, factors when, again, people were reanalyzing and looking at to see what, what structures the variation between people was um, essentially what kind of vegetables or how, much, how many plants people were eating. And so given this um, signature of there being a link between uh, our diets and the gut microbiome, what we've been really uh, focused on in the lab over the past couple of years is trying to determine or develop tools to think about how do we dissect those interactions? And so the first tool I'll be telling you about today is a method that we've developed that identifies specific gut microbial taxa that might be metabolizing or able to grow on um, specific dietary nutrients. And one of the things that we had to do in developing this technique was develop a way to culture bacteria in high throughput because there are, as many of you know, lots of different bacterial taxa within a person, you know, on the order of a maybe a few hundred, 
And if those taxes don't vary, or they vary, sorry, they're not shared between individuals. And as a result, if we want to work with microbial isolates directly from people, we need to have the ability to culture at scale. And so this project was started by an intrepid graduate student, Rachel Bloom, who was in our lab and uh, graduated a couple of years ago. But when she started the project, what we ultimately settled on in order to culture bacteria in high throughput was a microfluidic technique that Rachel put together. And the idea is that this works using a, the biophysical properties of oil and water, which is that they don't mix. And what we can do is we can have bacteria in a hydrophilic uh, media, and we can push it through a jets of oil. And what ends up happening or fall, coming out the other side are these emulsions or droplets of media that if we dilute our input bacterial community sufficiently, we can end up with no more than one bacteria per emulsion droplet. And so these emulsions or, or um, uh, uh, little bacterial cultures are, are almost like bubbles. They are, um, you know, just to give you an intuition for, for this, this is almost like the science, or this is the science of salad dressing. When you make salad dressing, there's oil and water. When you shake it up, there's this cream on top that's actually a, an emulsion. And so we make emulsions under controlled settings where, again, they're loaded with individual gut microbes, and we can do this at scale. So um, in minutes, you can culture or you can create millions of these emulsions. And so this is what we do in order to culture out um, lots and lots of individual gut microbes from, say, a given stool sample. Now, um, this is how it looks in practice. One of the things that we focused on was making um, this technique accessible and um, importantly, also compact so that it fits in an anaerobic chamber. We use off-the-shelf syringe pumps. Um, this is all within an anaerobic chamber. There's a little uh, glass chip underneath this um, um, microscope here. This is um, an image of the emulsions being pushed through the chip. Droplets are made, and then we can incubate in the anaerobic chamber. So now that we've developed this technique, how do we use it to study um, uh, diet or, or um, metabolism? And sorry, before I go on, I'll mention that uh, I want to acknowledge the people who have come before us and helping to develop these techniques. We're not the first to use microfluidics to culture gut microbes, or at least bacteria. Um, Carson Zangler was doing this um, more decades ago on marine microbes. And then more recently, uh, groups including, um, and folks like Bill Watterson at, at Chicago were recently trying this out on gut microbes and antibiotic resistance. But as I was hinting at, what we wanted to do was apply it now to um, the metabolism of dietary nutrients. And in particular, Max Via, a postdoc in our lab, um, applied this technique now to screening dietary carbohydrates and how they're utilized by different gut bacterial populations across individuals. The way Max did this was that he um, took fecal microbial communities directly from stool from nine healthy volunteers, and then he cultured each one of those communities out um, an isolated bacteria using this microfluidic technique in a minimal media where the only carbon source were these um, different uh, dietary carbohydrates. And so whatever grew in those cultures, uh, we assumed had to be able to utilize one of these um, carbon sources or carbohydrates as a carbon source. And so after running all these cultures or, or running the microfluid technique, this is the kinds of data that come out. So these heat maps now, each of the columns is a different uh, carbohydrate and each of the rows now is a different bacterial taxa. Um, they're actually colored by phyla. And uh, sorry, I put the, um, <laughs> the key I think um, might be hidden here. The heat now indicates which uh, or the ability of certain taxa to grow. And so when you see black, the uh, taxa aren't growing, there are columns of black, those are the negative controls. Um, and areas of heat indicate um, groups of taxa that can grow on say like given carbon sources. We can amalgamate these and look across individuals. And um, some of the patterns that I'll, I'll just highlight in this short talk that jump out to me that I thought were really interesting is the fact that um, we saw um, that some gut microbes, for example, only seem to grow on, a, on specific carbon sources or one carbon source, like uh, here in this case, uh, these group of microbes across individuals only grow on xylan, 
Whereas there are other uh, gut bacteria that uh, we think of in a way as metabolic generalists or that they can grow on multiple carbon sources. And we see them across um, growing on multiple different carbohydrates here and they're generalists. And I'm not showing you the data here, but it turns out that generalists tend to be more common than specialists. And so we think that this might be evidence of uh, um, this being a, a beneficial strategy for bacteria in the gut. Okay, so now I'm gonna pivot um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how do we identify the nutrients, the dietary nutrients that people might be uh, exposing their gut microbes to. And um, this is actually uh, in, in kind of a harder question than you might think, or at least than I initially thought, because it's actually surprisingly tricky to know what people are eating. A dietary assessment is typically done via recall, or um, basically you ask people what they ate, and this presents some challenges for participants. Um, one is that you just have to have a good memory, and it takes a lot of time. So a standard dietary assessment tool, which is NCI's uh, Dietary Health Questionnaire, um, is 40 pages long, and there are um, hundreds of questions that involve things like, um, you know, distinguishing the different kinds of um, uh, pies you eat and what they what goes into them. I mean, imagine these kinds of questions now over and over, like over a hundred times. And it, it, it can be quite tedious and people actually drop out of our studies because they don't want to fill out these questionnaires. Um, and also you can imagine that filling out those kinds of surveys isn't easy for, for lots of people. So in particular, I, I think of um, my kids when um, they're young, they um, are still learning to read. So it could be tricky for people like them to fill out these kinds of surveys. And they also love these Filipino ube pies that you know you don't see ube in like a typical NCI dietary health questionnaire. How do you deal with foods that um, come from different cultures, let's say, and that might not necessarily be captured by these sorts of surveys? So there are all kinds of uh, reasons why it can be kind of tricky and, and hard to get accurate and comprehensive dietary data from people. And so what we have been working on in um, for the past couple of years started with a collaboration with um, field ecologists, Tyler Kartsnell and Rob Pringle um, at Princeton, who had been working on trying to figure out what large herbivore eat in the African savanna. And Rob and Tyler never um, thought that they could ask their study participants what they were eating. And instead have been utilizing a technique known as DNA metabarcoding that ecologists have been refining for over a decade. And the technique actually has some um, similarity to, or a lot of similarity, I should say, to 16S sequencing, which microbiologists now rely on quite a bit to profile microbial communities. and takes advantage of the fact that um, everything that uh, we eat, um, I guess, aside from minerals and vitamins, uh, comes from something that was once alive. And living things have genomes and, and those genomes are formed of DNA. And so what you can do is that, or the concept is that, um, different food species that people might eat are going to get digested and then ultimately is excreted. You're going to end up um, having dietary DNA that's uh, left over in stool. And that if you can design marker genes, I'm sorry, if you can identify marker genes, amplify and sequence them, we could then match them to databases. Again, the way, like kind of like how 16S sequencing works and read out what people have been eating. So that was the concept. It works in um, large herbivores, um, but the question was, is this actually going to work in people? And so uh, two students in our lab, Aspen Reese and Brianna Patron, uh, started working on this a couple of years ago. And in order to do this, we thought that first, uh, just even demonstrate as a proof of concept, what we wanted to do is find some uh, stool samples from people where we knew what they were eating and that there we had actually collected stool from them so that we could try this technique out. And so um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, leftover uh, DNA that had been excreted or that had been collected in a prior uh, diet study um, with Peter Turnbow uh, when I was working with him as a, a junior fellow back at Harvard. Uh, we had done a study where we had um, fed volunteers diets that were formed from foods shown on these two different plates. There was one that was based on plant foods, one that was based on animal foods. And so, what happened was that people ate their normal diets, went on each of these uh, diets from up here, and then afterwards went back to their normal diets. And we had collected stool and actually ex extracted DNA from that stool uh, years ago. And um, uh, I'm grateful that Peter had held onto that DNA and, and um, uh, sent it back to us here at Duke, and we sequenced it. 
We amplified in particular a plant marker, um, at least uh, in our first proof of concept, this plant marker was for the uh, tRNL or a transfer RNA coding for lysine. And um, we sequenced it. And the idea is that that's gonna be a readout of the um, plant markers or plants that people are eating because this is part of, um, or this is found in the chloroplast. These, the resulting sequences we map to a reference library of sequences that had we had curated um, based on uh, the plants that we were guessing that people were eating. And um, I think one of the interesting things I'll mention about this that we um, do and that was um, Veronica Russell who had been in our lab um, visualized here was that you end up doing things like making trees of dietary um, plants in order to help with this mapping. And so I think it's always really interesting now to consider, or that, that gets you thinking from an evolutionary perspective about what we eat. And it helps to identify that, or recognize that there are some plants actually that we think of, or at least I typically think of as being distinct, things like turnips, kale, bok choy, um, broccoli, these are all brassica that actually are genetically really similar to one another and that we might not actually be able to tell apart. So we, we did the sequencing, we mapped the reads, um, and it turns out that we could detect quite a few um, dozens of different dietary plants that indeed we expected people to be eating on this study. Um, when we um, project the, um, these, uh, the DNA metabarcoding uh, patterns or profiles from each of the stool samples that we looked at onto uh, using a PCA, it turns out that um, we can indeed distinguish uh, stool samples collected from people when they were either on the plant um, portion of the uh, dietary intervention or what they were in their baseline periods when they were eating freely. So these samples um, uh, are separate. And when we overlay on top of that, what kinds of plants are actually distinguishing these groups, it makes sense. Um, things like oats, lentils, and gourds, these were all components of the foods that we were feeding people during the dietary intervention. And those reads are more common in those stool samples. So since then, um, Brianna has been following up on this uh, initial work and starting to identify or test how this technique works in freely eating populations. We've been taking advantage of um, stool samples that we had collected uh, by Zach Holmes in our lab over from a prebiotic trial that we've been carrying out also over the past couple of years involving several dozen individuals and what Brianna has been doing is analyzing samples from people prior to going on the prebiotic study. And so we can look at their normal variation in dietary intake, and we can also compare it to um, uh, dietary surveys that people have um, filled out using normal dietary assessment techniques, things like a dietary health questionnaire. And so what we, one of the things that jumps out of this that I think is really interesting is when we, we do a PCOA, uh, the dietary metabarcoding data, these are all the samples um, uh, shown here, they're colored by individual. It turns out that the, um, there's this pattern where samples from the same individual tend to cluster near one another. Um, and so that um, people seem to, there seems to be a, a, a coherent amount of inter-individual variation uh, between people where folks are more similar to themselves than they are to other people. And that kind of variation appears to also hold up or, or mirror with what we see using the typical dietary assessment tools. So this is um, built using the, uh, the survey or the dietary health questionnaire. This is the inter-individual variation you see, and there, there's a correlation between these things. Now, um, when we also look, as you can imagine, we're, we're also really interested in the microbiome. We can partition people as well by their microbiome variation. And one of the really interesting things that we've seen is that there also appears to be a coherence between these things or a shared set of structure, that people who have um, dissimilar uh, microbiota also appear to have dissimilar um, dietary intake as measured by metabarcoding. And one of the things that we're actively working on in the lab now is to try and figure out um, what are the dietary drivers of that kind of microbiome variation. Um, one way you can think about doing that is that when you do something like a PCA on the um, metabarcoding data and you do a PCA, sorry, this is the microbiome data, when you do a PCA on the metabarcoding data, we can start asking things like what principal components on this um, data sets align with or are, are correlated with principal components over here. And so that's a, an ongoing statistical endeavor in our lab. 
um, in order to find out these relationships. Okay, and so just to, to wrap up, I'll say that, um, or, or to summarize, you know, I think we're increasingly believing that DNA metabarcoding will be an effective way or, or a new kind of way to assess diet in individuals that's compatible with microbiome studies. And that I think all of our sequencing to date strongly suggests that indeed a lot of dietary DNA survives digestion and can be sequenced, and that we can use sequencing to distinguish people at least by overall dietary pattern. And that we can also, I think, start linking this now to microbiome variation. And I think that, um, you know, this is also hopefully going to be useful for folks in part because this might be at least a, a complement, if not an ability um, um, to dietary survey, if not an ability to actually provide dietary information in microbiome studies where you don't otherwise have dietary data. So sometimes um, studies don't ask people what they've been eating, or if a study has already been completed and there never was a dietary survey, this offers a way to go back and actually collect some dietary data as long as the DNA or stool had been saved. And so um, we also think uh, quite interestingly too, you know, you might be asking why do people vary? by their metabarcoding profiles. And I think this might suggest that perhaps there might be differences in even how people digest their food. All right, and so ongoing studies that we're working on using metabarcoding, I'll acknowledge that we are also trying to develop and working on primers that can amplify and sequence um, animal DNA. And we can detect animal DNA in, in pilot studies that corresponds with things like chicken, cow, um, and seafood. We are also developing and thinking a lot about techniques that we can apply to um, processed foods. So I think a, a really important question is how um, can we um, detect and, and potentially measure variation in, in how food was prepared and whether or not say it was eaten in a relatively whole form or whether or not it was heavily processed. One idea that Sharon Jang in our lab has been thinking about is whether or not food processing alters the integrity or, or just length of DNA and how well it can be amplified. And we, see, see, and we see some evidence in this when we analyze or try doing amplification from say wheat that's either in, in its raw form or has been processed and made into flour. We see differences in the overall um, uh, product length of um, things that are amplified. Using, sorry, um, we see differences in how well we can amplify different length amplicons where we use different primer sets that either bridge long parts of um, the uh, chloroplast genome or smaller parts of the chloroplast genome. And that might be a way of distinguishing foods by how much they've been processed. And then finally, um, one thing that we're really excited about is we are um, starting to look at populations of uh, different populations of people around the world. And in, for example, uh, we've been collaborating with Neil Serrana here at Duke looking at samples that um, come from cohorts in Kenya and comparing them to cohorts here in the US. And what one of the really interesting things that we've seen is that um, these uh, populations partition by foods that appear to be related to differences in, in geography. So these foods that go out here are associated with things like mung bean or millet that we don't see as often um, consumed in American populations and indeed appear to be overrepresented in populations or in, in my metabarcoding samples that are coming from our Kenyan cohort. So with that, I'll close and I want to acknowledge all our, our um, wonderful collaborators um, who, have, who do and enable this work as well as students in the lab who've been working on these projects and um, answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Rupe, and I'm a uh, research professor at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Dekas. Um, Dr. Dekas is an assistant professor at Stanford University in the Earth System Science Department and is a Simons Foundation Early Career Investigator in Marine Microbial Ecology and Evolution. She's broadly interested in how microbial life affects the chemistry and climate of the planet, today and throughout time, and specifically studies marine microbiology and biogeochemistry. Her research combines tools from molecular biology and isotope geochemistry to identify and quantify microbial metabolic capabilities, activity, and interactions, with a particular focus on understanding uncultured microorganisms in deep seawater and sediment. <clears throat> 
Uh, before joining the faculty at Stanford, Dr. Deckes was a Lawrence postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where she investigated the carbon metabolic flexibility of pelagic marine archaea. Uh, uh, Anne received a PhD in geobiology from California Institute of Technology as an NSF graduate research fellow, where she studied nitrogen fixation, methane oxidation, and sulfate reduction at deep sea methane seeps. The title of Anne's uh, presentation today is Characterizing Chemoautotrophy and Heterotrophy in Marine Archaea and Bacteria with Single Cell Multi Isotope NanoSIP. Please join me in welcoming Anne. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Dekas. I'm an assistant professor in the Earth System Science Department at Stanford University, and today I'm going to be talking about NanoSIMS. Thank you very much for tuning in, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. My group studies a range of environmental systems, primarily in the marine environment, to understand how bacteria and archaea impact global biogeochemical cycles and ultimately climate. One of the main themes in our group is to understand how this activity works at a single cell level. So we are developing and applying techniques to use nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometry in microbial ecology. So today I'll be giving you an overview of this technique. I will be giving you three examples from our work, and then I will be discussing limitations of the method and how to overcome them, as well as a summary and some insights on future directions. So most mic microbial taxa have not been cultured, as we all know, and this creates the challenge of understanding what they are capable of doing. Many techniques can approach this question, including metagenomics, but where many of these techniques fall short is understanding what these organisms are actually doing in situ. Using nanosims, we can answer that question as well as answer how much, so get a quantitative measurement of that activity and what controls how much. So nanosims is a solution to measure the activity and physiology of uncultured microbes. What exactly is it? It's a mass spectrometer with much higher spatial resolution than a typical mass spectrometer. So what this allows to do is get single cell isotope information. You can use a primary cesium or oxygen um, primary beam. You analyze your sample in a vacuum, so it does have to be dead. And then you can analyze up to five or seven masses, depending on your model of nanosims at once. This is a cartoon of what this analysis actually looks like with the primary ion beam hitting the sample, generating secondary ions, which are actually analyzed. I'm not going to get into the technical details of how this works today, but I'll refer you to several excellent review articles so you can take a screenshot of this and catch up with them later if you'd like. So a classic example of how SIMS has been applied to microbial ecology is the anaerobic oxidation of methane. In 2001, Victoria Orphan and colleagues um, measured the isotopic composition of consortia of archaea and bacteria with the question of whether they were oxidizing methane. And because methane has extremely isotopically depleted isotope signatures in the environment, they were able to measure this naturally isotopically depleted carbon signal in the middle of the aggregate, meaning that the methane oxidizers were the archaea. This was really exciting because until then, SIMS had primarily been applied to studies of earth and planetary science questions, so not so much microbial ecology, and this kind of opened up this approach for the rest of the field. Since then, there's been a lot of improvements in this, including the um, use of nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometry, which instead of giving us a bulk isotope measurement um, with this instrument, uh, the Kamika 1270 that has about five micron spatial resolution, we can get this single cell resolution with nanosims. So in this example, this was work I did in Victoria Orphan's lab. We looked at these same consortia and you see the archaea in red and the bacteria in green, and you can match the microscope image to the nanosims image and actually see how the incorporation of 15N from 15N2 varies with depth um, in the aggregate. So in this image, you can circle particular regions of interest and extract isotope ratios for particular cells, and then see over time in the analysis how that changes with depth. So we were able to confirm nitrogen fixation in the amniarchia. This approach has been used to study this 
um, consortia of organisms for many years since. And in this paper, which is another really nice example where they were able actually able to embed the, the consortia and then do nice thin sections, they were able to get very precise measurements of the uptake of 15 N ammonium in individual cells. And so this is a tracer of overall anabolic activity. And it was able to show that based on the patterns of activity with relation to the symbionts, that a diffusible intermediate was not likely what was being passed between the two symbionts. And instead, the anaerobic of oxidation of methane was thermodynamically favorable because of direct electron transfer. So these are two really different examples. One is using a specific substrate, asking whether or not the organisms are capable of taking up the substrate. And in this example, we're seeing the pattern of overall activity telling us something about how the interaction works between the cells. So in those last two examples, both of them used stable isotope probing, which is really common to perform before nanosims analysis. So I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about this. A given community of microbial cells has a predicted value of its ratio of 15N to 14N or 13C to 12C, and that's just the natural abundance of these stable isotopes. If you incubate the cells with a particular substrate with an isotope label, the biomass will end up enriched if those cells are capable of consuming that substrate. You can measure the isotopic composition of cells several different ways. One of them is isotope ratio mass spectrometry, which requires a whole scoop of cells and is therefore a bulk measurement, and you lose any taxa-specific or cell-specific differentiation. Another is density gradient-based DNA or RNA SIP, where you extract DNA from the cells and using a density gradient, separate out the DNA sequences and are able to see which ones are enriched. And this is great to connect function with phylogeny, but is not quantitative and loses the spatial information. Nanosims, on the other hand, since it's a single cell measurement, is quantitative, allows you to retain the spatial information, and depending on what um, techniques you do to prepare your sample before you put it in the nanosims, can actually link function with phylogeny. So you can kind of creatively design your experiment in ways to ask a lot of different questions. So I'm going to kind of categorize those questions here. So you can detect and quantify anabolic activity using these general substrates that are either universally um, assimilated by organisms or at least assimilated by the organisms that you are interested in. And you can use this in life detection experiments to see if cells can grow in extremely um, harsh environments. And it's good for that because it has a low detection limit and it can also detect activity in even a few cells within an otherwise dormant community. It can determine the role of spatial associations in microbial activity, the effect of environmental parameters if you incubate under all different conditions and then see um, which conditions your specific taxa favor in terms of its overall activity level. And you can also scan cells in a community if you don't know who they are to see overall the activity level of all of the unidentified cells. So we'll talk more about that technique in a few minutes. That's a less common application. You can test for a specific metabolic function, which is really terrific for um, characterizing the metabolism of uncultured taxa. You can characterize microbe-microbe interactions and centrifies. And you can use multiple isotopes to observe simultaneous metabolisms within individual cells. And this is a really neat feature of NanoSim's um, experimental design because you can use 13C and 15N and 18O and see actually in an individual cell how the uptake of these different substrates indicating different metabolisms compare. So in the first example I'll discuss, we'll be looking at a diatom fungal parasitism. And this work was led by a postdoc in my group, Isabel Clawon. So the scientific background here is that single cell phytoplankton contribute almost half of the world's primary production. And these fungal parasites are common, but they're really poorly described. So here you see um, them in green actually attacking the diatom. The tiny blue dots are um, DAPI stained cells, bacterial cells. So our question was how much carbon do the fungal parasites siphon from the diatoms and what is the effect on the rest of the community? So we were able to answer this question using um, a cultured system of these organisms and incubations with 13C bicarbonate. So we analyzed the diatoms both with a Kamika 1280 with the um, 
lower spatial resolution as well as the NanoSims 50L with a higher spatial resolution, both so that we could use a higher intensity beam and analyze more diatoms, which are hard to get through that thick frustral, um, and have the sp higher spatial resolution to measure the bacteria. But you can see even in the NanoSims analysis, this um, is showing uh, an image we collected later during the analysis, we do eventually get into the biomass of the diatom with the nanosims as well. So using this approach, we were able to determine that the fungal sporangia derived 100% of their carbon from the photosynthetic diatom. The fungal zoospores, which are what the sporangia eventually open up into in their next um, stage of life before they can att uh, attack the other cells, um, were also getting 100% of their carbon from the diatom. And associated bacteria were getting 70 to 100%. So again, they're getting a whole bunch too. And the free living bacteria were around 30%. So combining these numbers with environmental data that tells us how frequent these interactions are, we were able to calculate that up to 20% of photosynthetic carbon ends up shunted through this fungal shunt, as we call it, instead of going through the classic microbial loop during a fungal infection bloom. So this has pretty big implications for carbon cycling in aquatic environments because we have this diversion of carbon from the microbial loop immediately to higher trophic levels because these zoospores are consumed immediately by these higher consumers. In example two, I'll discuss the organic matter uptake by marine town archaeota. And this is work led by a postdoc in my group named Alma Parada. So marine group one town archaeota comprise about 20% of all marine cells, extremely abundant, and they're more abundant with death. There aren't that many cultured representatives, but the ones that we do have are chemoautotrophic. The strange thing is environmental data suggests that there could be some mixotrophy or even a subset of these organisms could be heterotrophic in the environment. So we wanted to know, do uncultured MG1 lineages assimilate organic carbon in situ? So to answer this question, we collected water from the environment at 150 meters water depth and incubated with a whole suite of 13C and 15N organic matter substrates. We used fluorescence in situ hybridization to specifically identify the Tom Archaeota in this case. We did not have to do that in the case of the diatoms because their really distinct morphology allowed us to know who they were. Um, in this case, we needed to use fish to differentiate them. What you can see here, the green are the Tom Archaeota, are that they really did not assimilate carbon from glucose, pyruvate, or oxaloacetate, despite the fact that the bacteria and the DAPI stain cells in these incubations assimilated it right readily. What they did assimilate was a tiny bit of carbon from urea and amino acids. And when we look up, look at the nitrogen incorporation from these um, substrates, we see that the nitrogen incorporation from urea and amino acids in the archaea was equivalent to that from ammonium. So what we can conclude is that marine town archaeota are primarily chemoautotrophic, but they are using nitrogenous organic matter for both carbon and nitrogen anabolism, a little bit of carbon, but quite a bit of nitrogen. In the next example, I'm gonna show you how we're using nanosims to understand community function more broadly. So instead of focusing on a specific taxa, we're gonna look at activity in the entire community. We're gonna ask general questions, like how many cells are active? How is the activity distributed between the active cells? And how does that change, for instance, with depth in the water column? What are the primary metabolisms occurring? This work is led by a postdoc in my group, Nestor Arandia Gorostidi. So to figure out the overall metabolisms occurring in a particular sample, we are using a technique that is derived from um, what has been done with lipids previously called lipid dual SIP, where we actually incubate with 13C bicarbonate and 15N ammonia as a general indicator of activity. The organisms that take up the um, bicarbonate are autotrophic, and the organisms that take up the ammonium but not the bicarbonate are heterotrophic by default. And we can screen up to about a thousand cells a day this way. So we call this a high throughput screening of metabolic activity in these unidentified cells. 
Like I said, over time, the organisms will assimilate one or both of these substrates, and that allows us to differentiate them into autotrophs, heterotrophs, or inactive cells if they take up neither. So in this example, you can see marine cells that have been filtered onto a 0.2 micron filter, and that's put directly into the nanosims. Each one of these tiny dots is a different cell. I'm gonna ask you to keep track of these three cells as I show you what they look like in their different isotope um, views. So this is just the CN counts. So everywhere where you have carbon and nitrogen, you can see all of the cells. Now you can only see the cells that were taking up the 13C bicarbonate. So they're enriched in 13C and you can see it's a small subset of the community and only one of the three cells that we were watching. When you look at the 15 and 14N ratio, you can see that most of the cells in the sample were active, but only two of the three that we were looking at. So given this combination of information, we can call these three cells an autotroph, an inactive cell, or a heterotroph. And similarly, we can classify all of these cells the same way. In addition to just saying yes or no to substrate assimilation, we can quantify it and compare the relative assimilation of the 13C to the 15N to learn more about their true metabolism. So in that way, we plot their isotopic composition in 15N incorporation versus 13C incorporation space. And if they fall above this two to one line, they're a heterotroph and below it, an autotroph. When we plot the cells from this particular sample that way, we see that it separates really clearly into two different groups. These are the heterotrophs and these are the autotrophs. We can therefore quantify their metabolisms and say 8% of them were chemoautotrophic, 83% were heterotrophic, and a few of them were also inactive. Really importantly, what this comparison allows us to do is differentiate between truly autotrophic cells and heterotrophic cells that take up some inorganic carbon due to, for instance, anaplerotic reactions. So an assay that only detected uptake of inorganic carbon might overestimate the number of autotrophs because they would include these heterotrophs that were consuming a tiny bit of inorganic carbon as autotrophs as well. And here we can differentiate between cells taking up most of their carbon from bicarbonate versus only a tiny bit. We can also look at the distribution of uptake of substrates um, in entire communities and with depth. So here we're looking at the incorporation of 15N ammonium and 15N amino acids as general assays of activity in this surface water sample. And so both substrates are telling us that about 90% of the cells are active in this sample, but we're seeing that the cells take up more amino acids or more nitrogen from amino acids. Here we have the um, atom percent enrichment on this axis than ammonium. When we look at how that changes with depth, we see that there's a slight increase at 150 meters in the percentage of active cells and otherwise a decrease as we would expect and a change in the actual amount of amino acids incorporated. We wanted a metric to be able to quantify the distribution of incorporation within the community. So we borrowed a term from economics that's actually traditionally used to measure income inequality in a population. So here we plot the percentage of activity versus the percentage of cells. And if the, um, the line plots along the one-to-one -one line, it would indicate perfect equality of activity distribution. The more this line sags below that one-to-one -one line, the more unequal the distribution is. And we've done that for both the uptake of ammonium and amino acids. You can see that as you go down with depth in the water column, this line sags more and more, indicating more and more inequality. So a fewer percentage of cells, a smaller percentage of cells is responsible for more activity with depth. You can quantify this metric and actually see there's a very good correlation showing that inequality actually increases with depth in the water column. So what are the, some of the limitations of nanosims? Um, first of all, it is limited to directly observing anabolic processes, but with creative experimental design, you can get feedback on um, more diverse physiology as well. It's low throughput if you're measuring taxonomically identified cells. And substrate recycling can complicate the interpretation. So you need to design your experiments very carefully to either um, account for that or just not do particular experiments where that can't be fully accounted for. <laughs> 
In some cases, substrate recycling is actually a benefit because you can see the flow from one organism to another. So it just really depends what your question is, if this is um, uh, a problem or not. Sample prep can also quant um, complicate your ability to quantify the results and specifically fluorescence in situ hybridization. So I'll just spend a minute talking about that before I wrap up. So cardfish in particular, which is used for small and slow growing cells involves many steps in which you are both removing the isotopically labeled carbon and adding natural abundance carbon from the reagents. And multiple groups have observed this effect. And my graduate student, Nicolette Meyer, kind of summarized all of the observations and found that cardfish can reduce isotope enrichment by up to 80%. So it's a significant effect. And the effect varies by taxa, growth stage, and protocol. So we can't just have a universal correction factor that brings us back to the original value. This means that when we're interpreting NanoSIMS data from experiments that have used cardfish, we need to think of the results as a range of possibilities. We can still constrain the amount of substrate that they assimilated, and we can certainly say whether or not they assimilated it. But we need to be careful about being too precise in how we report these um, values. One really interesting thing is the isotope dilution for carbon relative to nitrogen is consistent across all of the different organisms tested and all the different labs that have looked at this. Therefore, relative values can be determined accurately. So for instance, the incorporation of one particular substrate relative to the total growth, if you're gonna measure that through um, the uptake of a universal substrate. So if you remember our experiment with organic matter, in the Taumar Kyoto, we can actually calculate the percentage of carbon that is derived from nitrogenous organic sources to their total carbon using this ratio and the correction I mentioned using that, the slope of the line I previously showed. So from this, we can determine pretty precisely that 0.5 to 11% of their total carbon biomass is derived from urea, urea and amino acids. So in summary, nanosims can quantify anabolic activity of uncultured microorganisms. Using creative experimental design, it can really characterize microbial physiology and community function in diverse ways. I think the future direction of this technique is to continue improving our ability to precisely quantify this uptake, especially given different um, sample preparation techniques, and also increasing the throughput so we can even measure um, taxonomically identified cells in a much faster fashion. Finally, I would like to see an increase in the access to this um, technique. There are user facilities that are available to any researcher around the US and around the world. And the more researchers we have using it, I think the more creative applications we're going to see. So I would love that. I would like to thank several people from my group as well as previous groups that I've been a part of, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. My name is Jian Xu from Single Cell Center of Qingdao Institute of Bioenergy and Bioprocess Technology at Chinese Academy of Sciences. Our speaker today is Manuel Lebecki, who is head of the Metabolic Interactions Group at the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Germany. His work specifically focused on the chemical interactions between bacterial symbionts and their eukaryotic hosts. He is an expert in mass spectroscopy-based metabolomics. His group de develops high-resolution spatial imaging methods for in situ measurements of metabolites in host microbe systems. Today, he's going to bring us an exciting talk with the title, Spatial Metabolomics of In-Situ Host Microbe Intentions at a Micrometer Scale. Let's welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, seminar series. I will present today um, the topic from, from my lab, Spatial Metabolomics and Host Microbe Interactions. And before I start into, go into research, here is uh, the team um, doing, doing the actually work. So we... Uh, probe microbial biochemistry using mass spectrometry methods. And you can see also our lab here and pictures from the field because we are going out and diving into the deep sea, but also in shallow waters to collect samples and bring them back to the mass spectrometry lab. Um, 
And when we look at into metabolic interactions, uh, we look at the chemicals because we are we think these are the essential parts of, of the communication. And we know that microorganisms exchange metabolites. They exchange them with other microbes in their surroundings. They exchange compounds with higher animals, maybe with their host or with hosting um, plants. And they take up uh, metabolites or give up, exude metabolites into the environment. And this is all to, to help communication. So they use signaling molecules. They use um, this for cooperation. So they exchange nutrients, but they're also using it for chemical defense. And then they are producing, for example, toxins. And if we want to study those uh, metabolic interactions in uh, microbial communities, we first need to look into how microbial communities are structured. And one method, one in situ method is um, the fluorescence-based method called FISH here, where we can um, probe bacterial cells with, with a 16S probe and then use microscopy to show bacterial cells inside host cells, like an example from, from our lab here, or when cells, microbial cells are on the surface of tissues, like um, this very nice example here, when uh, bacterial cells are um, in a st structured community on top of a, of a tongue or um, not so structured in the, in the gut, uh, in the gut lumen, closely connected to the epithelium of the gut, but also on top of um, root surfaces, we have um, bacterial communities which interact with a uh, with plant and with other bacteria in their surroundings. So this in situ method shows us where the bacteria are and, and which ones, but we don't know which um, metabolic processes are going um, on. And to do this, one needs another in situ method and um, uh, a favorite one of our lab is uh, mass spectrometry uh, imaging. And this is actually a, a surface scanning method. So here we have a, a tissue section on a glass slide or a bacterial co colony on a, on a glass slide. We scan across the surface, we ionize the molecules, and then we detect many signals um, with a detector. And by scanning different positions per pixel, per position, we get a mass spectrum. And then in the software, we can stick that together and ask questions, where are specific um, compounds, chemicals, or how are they distributed, and can also overlay um, those images. And you will see a couple of those later in, in my slides. There's one problem with metabolic imaging. It, it lacks microbe relevant resolution if we want to image metabolites. And there is high resolution methods like nanosims, which can track activity of single bacterial cells, which has a resolution below the one micrometer, like also toxins, which can measure the metals and fragments of compounds. And on the other hand, we have low resolution uh, methods like um, DESI MSI or MALDI MSI, where we can um, measure proteins and intact metabolites. And there we speak about a resolution from 100 micrometer to down to 10 micrometer. And pioneering work here, for example, is um, an image of bacterial colonies from the Durenstein lab and also other examples are shown. And there's one gap, and this is shown here, the gap between the 10 micrometer to one micrometer and um, being capable of measuring intact molecules. And our lab is aiming to fill that gap. And we decided to go on with MALDI MSI, Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. And I want you to dive into research now and go in with me to the to the deep sea. What you can see here are muscle beds in the, at the bottom of the ocean and um, close to hydrothermal vents. And those muscles, they can only live there because they have um, intracellular bacterial symbionts performing um, biochemical actions to provide the, the host uh, with nutrition. And here you can see how um, the bacterial community structure. So we have two major symbionts and also shown here in yellow, uh, a parasite is again shown with an in situ method with the fish method. And to visualize uh, metabolic interactions in situ, we use MALDI, I told you, and spearheaded by Benedict Geyer in my lab, he developed a um, protocols to 
do high resolution mass spectrometry imaging. And here you can see um, those metabolite maps from um, gill tissue of our, of our muscles. And each map shows a different, different metabolite. And you can overlay them and you can see here already, these are so-called gill filaments filled with bacteria and overlaid here the, the, um, the maps of three different lipids. And important, an important development in our lab was that from this same tissue section, which was imaged for metabolites, we perform the in situ hybridization. So we, we use probes to detect the symbionts and host nuclei, and then can use a high resolution microscopy and show how this community is structured. And this gives us an untargeted view from the MALDI, label-free view, and it's multiplex. So we measure hundreds to thousands of, of, of signals in combination with a targeted method for single bacterial cells. And with, by using 16S probes, we also have, in principle, a link to the, to the genome. So I show the workflow here again in this uh, series. What is important, we use cryofix tissues. Um, there is a lot of um, sample preparation needed to, to gain high resolution images when we do the metabolite imaging. And accordingly, what I told you, we have the fluorescence microscopy of, of the tissue section. And then it's important to overlay both images in a correlator phase so that each pixel um, from the microscopy fits to the pixel from the mass spectrometry imaging to, to have a high quality data set to, to dive into. And I wanna show you how we do, um, or how we came to those images. So MALI imaging is on the verge to resolve bacteria cells. And here you can see um, a fish image again of a single filament of our muscles. And when we started developing those methods a couple of years ago, the standard, um, Mass spec imaging setup was able to, or has a, had a spatial resolution of 25 micrometer. And that's a, a mass spec image you would see from, from this um, type of sample. So barely anything to see. If you improve things um, to 15 micrometer, that's still nothing comparable to the microscopy image. But once you move um, to 10 micrometer or five micrometer, you start to see structures which resemble um, the microscopy. And there's a, an important collaboration for us um, with the Bernhard Spengler Lab in Münster. They um, have a commercial setup where we can do five micrometer um, measurements. And here you see another example, an overlay of three different molecules. And you see the structures clearly you can um, differentiate them, but it's not what we um, like the microscopy image. They have a second a prototype which can achieve 1.5 micrometer. And when we visit their lab, um, we could achieve three micrometer spatial resolution with a sample preparation used. And now you can start to see really something which looks um, like, like the microscopy image on the top, top left corner. And as we want to uh, fill that gap of, for, for microbiology, we collaborated with a um, Dreisewert lab in, in Münster. They use a different um, mass spectrometry setup, which can achieve less than one micrometer spatial resolution. And uh, with our samples, we could achieve two micrometer. And this is kind of double the resolution to our previous measurements. And you can clearly see sharp images, um, which tell us um, a lot about the, the chemicals in that microbial community. So these images are beautiful, but we want to know which compounds are there. And for that, we need to identify all those compounds from, from a mass spectrum. I told you that each uh, pixel contains hundreds to thousands of peaks. And with a great help and, and development from Theodora Alexandrov at the EMBL, he developed a so-called uh, annotation tool, Metaspace. You can upload your data and get annotations for, um, for your peaks. And then you get to know get to know your uh, metabolites in your sample. And approximately we get 50 to 100 identifications um, in our data sets. It's not a lot, so there's a lot of unknown compounds, but those um, identified metabolites help us already to, to peek into the symbiotic system. So two compounds were identified in, in our symbiotic system and 
to zoom in into a specific region to highlight what we found. Here you can see the fish images and we highlighted three different um, host cells filled with, um, filled with symbionts and only shown is here in purple one symbiont type. And the Metaspace tool identified us two hopanoids, hopanoid A and B. So there are symbiont specific compounds. And we expected um, to see those two compounds in all host cells because they contained uh, the symbiont. But we were surprised. We didn't see that so there was a, a heterogeneous distribution of those compounds. So some host cells uh, contained only hopanoid B, whereas others uh, contained a mixture or only one. So this was a surprise to us. And we could, for the first time on a micro scale, see those uh, phenotypic differences of um, one bacterium in, in a host. And to elucidate this further, we developed a, a new method for, for us. And because we wanted to know what's going on with this um, heterogeneity, Neti in the system, we acquired a new uh, metabolite image of a tissue section and then um, work done by Dennis and my group. So he defined regions of this phenotype and we went to, to um, our, in our institute to a laser capture microdissection microscope and cut it out these different regions. So the orange region and the um, cells, host cells or tissue regions with a, with this purple color and then performed a transcriptome analysis. And that was um, this great help from Harald uber because we have low input um, samples, but we could retrieve um, RNA from those samples. After we measured this tissue section with the MALDI and could find um, certain genes different, differently expressed. But this is data, data in progress. I just want to show you how we approach this when we see this diff these different phenotypes and how we go on um, with different omics methods to kind of solve that puzzle. So what I showed you on the last slides was actually a zoom in into an animal and that's highlighted here. So our muscles actually are much bigger than just this few 100 times 100 micrometer field of view um, for our metabolite analysis. So we learned a lot from that, but we also uh, zoom out we apply the fluorescence and situ hybridization on the whole animal that we can see um, symbionts in the main organ, but also um, we see bacterial cells in, in the gut of the muscle. And then we, we perform metabolite imaging on whole animal um, size. And by the combination of seeing metabolites and also maybe in future applying the transcriptome approach, we can put together a metabolic map of host metabolism and bacterial metabolism. So we can say that metabolite imaging delivers chemical answers to biological questions. And now is the, the question, what's next actually for mass spectrometry imaging and microbiology? Because we closed kind of that gap, which I introduced to you. But obviously, we would like to push the boundaries of spatial resolution even more. So really, this fish image to have this um, as a mass spec image, so that in a single host cell filled with bacterial symbionts, we get a readout of the metabolites from um, single bacterial cells from this uh, cell. For that, we also need a higher speed and sensitivity of the mass spectrometer that helps us really to, to scan um, so many pixels across uh, this tissue section. And what I think is also important is to widen the molecular window of compounds we want to observe with mass spec imaging. So the majority of, of data I showed you, these were lipids, but um, mass spectrometry can do many more things. And I think important molecules in the direction our lab is, for example, also protein glycans. And here you can see a map of the deep sea muscle um, where we image the um, glycolization of proteins across different tissues and also um, extending the view into lipopolysaccharides or proteins. And one important message I think to, to get to these biological questions with mass spectrometry imaging is that we need to have um, better accessibility of the mass spec data for microbiologists so that they don't, or we don't shy away from, from the chemical side and dive into it and use it for our biological questions. And we need intuitive ways to explore all of these metabolite images and the detected chemical space. And one way we are doing this or try to do this in our lab 
is that we use correlative imaging. So things, microscopy and, and uh, tomography methods, people know, and combine this with a, with a chemical view of the uh, mass spectrometry imaging part. And this is, again, for, uh, data from Benedict uh, from my group, where he combined the, uh, the chemistry of tissue section, sections with the histology. So again, highlighting where symbionts are and combines this in a tomographic model. And this is an, another animal we are looking at. This is an, is an earthworm um, where we have a 3D tomographic model and kind of tied in into it are microscopy images, mass spectrometry images. And this is a model where you can kind of in principle fly through and, and, and see where metabolites are and get a better understanding from the biological perspective, um, how metabolites are distributed. And this helped us to find, for example, here, this was an unexpected result. There are nematodes, parasitic nematodes, sitting in the tissue, and we could then um, image the, the metabolism around those, those nematodes. And I think that is uh, going in a 3D way helps to understand biology um, in a better way. And with that, I'm finished and I would like to acknowledge um, my team because they do most of the work in the lab and bring in great ideas. I would like to thank the collaborators um, I mentioned here and I would like to, to thank the Department of Symbiosis and especially Nicole Dubillier um, for um, hosting me with my group in this department and making this kind of research um, possible. And thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all three speakers for a fantastic presentation today. So we're going to have um, 30 minutes of panel discussions with them. I, I noticed that there was a lot of there was not a lot of questions in the in the Q and A. So don't hesitate to post your your questions directly in the Q and A, and I will um, I will ask them directly to the speakers. Um, since Manuel just finished, uh, I. I was, I was, as everyone, I, I, I suspect, very impressed by the, 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 the images that you just presented. And reading, reading the paper, um, sometimes it doesn't give justice to the amount of work that goes into this kind of method development. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. How long did it take you to, to develop this technique from start to finish? And, and what, was the what were the major hurdles along the way? Okay, uh, thanks, JB. It's actually it took us a long, a long time, and it was just not um, our efforts, but also the efforts of the people developing MassBag devices and probes. But I would say the major impact we had on this kind of workflow was to get the the sample preparation ready and how to deal with the data and put all of that together in one workflow that we can really work on that high resolution. So just combining both things on a same tissue section took us really yeah a few years to get it get it combined because um, it's different than what Anne presented in her talk with the nanosim cells are fixed for our approaches when we measure metabolites we use cryofix samples or samples which are shock frozen and then doing the sectioning and imaging on those plus the the fish uh, hybridizations afterwards that took a little a lot of fine tuning I would say and we were lucky. Um, the devices developed in that same uh, time frame, so we we got access to to um, nice multi systems where we could practice our stuff, and then do, decided for one system a prototype where we can do where we did our work with. So um, and this is constantly now still under process to to prepare the samples to go below the one micrometer, because um, I mentioned on one of the slides that the machine can do below one micrometer, but we were only able to do two because our sample prep was not um, as perfect as they should be for this type of analysis. Okay. Um, a, a quick question for, for Lawrence and um, for, for you. How does your macro predict system compares to other methods in terms of numbers of cells that you're able to isolate and then cultivate. Can you can you comment on that? Yeah, so um, 
we can um, separate um, in droplets, as I was saying, probably hundreds of thousands, if not more than that, individual microbial cells. But of course, what's probably more relevant is how many actually get cultured and grow. And when we estimate from that, you can uh, sequence these things over time and, and look at the kind of accumulation of DNA across droplets over time. And that kind of tells you what's growing. It looks like um, somewhere around 30%, which I think is roughly in line with what you know, sort of a, other uh, culture surveys end up with. Okay, and 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 can you can you comment how how easy it it is to adopt in in the lab your your system because you're working in a fully anaerobic chamber, um, so how easy would it be for people to to try to to mimic? Yeah, so um, I guess like most experimental techniques, you know, there there is some. Um, uh, getting it working the first time, you know, took, took a little bit. Um, but we've tried to make the protocols cleaner. And one of the things that we also, I think did that makes it more accessible is we had it working using relatively off the shelf, um, parts, things like syringe pumps that everyone, um, you know, that aren't super expensive and that you can are, are readily available. So I'd like to think that it's the kind of thing that could be tried or, or adopted by other groups. And I should also mention too, that our, our microfluidic chips, we um, you know, don't custom fabricate them. We're using chips that are, are commercially available, things like that. Thanks, thanks. Um, a question to, to all speaker now, um, how important is the technology to, you, to your science versus hypothesis? Um, do you see do you see yourself more um, keen to to explore new ways to um, to ask a question or yeah can you comment on that? I can comment on that. Um, I think I personally um, think NanoSims is a great tool, but it's not the only tool. I'm really interested in how microbes are affecting biogeochemical cycles in general. So I'm happy to use whatever technique is the best one for the question I'm asking. Um, I think nanosims in particular has been used as a hypothesis tester for many years. Um, it really relies on the kind of contextual information that's provided by techniques with a broader perspective like metagenomics and like um, kind of uh, um, even isotope measurements that are at a broader scale. But I think that's being flipped recently and nanosims can now be used as a hypothesis generator as well as we're scanning entire communities for this metabolic um, uh, characterization. So I think as a tool, nanosims can be used as either a hypothesis generator or as a hypothesis tester now, which I, I think is nice. Any, anybody else want to comment on, on that? The, the place of, of hypothesis testing in, in your science as opposed to, to uh, techniques? I, I can just kind of uh, parallel the words from Anna. So the uh, mass spec imaging on, on our side with metabolites, I think it's, it's similar. So we have projects where we really have a clear question and we want to look for specific compounds, which is in principle quite, quite easy when you, you try to image those, is your hypothesis kind of right or not? But also a majority of our, our work is um, more kind of looking into the samples, see how metabolites are distributed and then start, okay, this was unexpected. What does that mean? Why do we see XY compound in this position in this tissue or in those cells or these really high levels of a certain compound? Then you start to see, oh, that, that I cannot explain. So you go back to the genome or transcriptome whatsoever and try to connect the dots and kind of start to ask um, new questions. So also developing hypotheses from that. Yeah, I feel exactly the same way. And um, I, I will confess though to having trained as an engineer and it is really fun sometimes as well to develop new techniques. But I agree, obviously at the end of the day, you wanna use them to, to learn something intelligent. One commonality between between the, the three talks as well was um, that you, you're all looking um, 
directly or indirectly at the at the uncultured majority. Um, Lawrence, you're trying to isolate some of some of these microbes, and you look at their metabolism. Manual, you you investigate their metabolic interactions. So, um, how if you had if you had a magic wand um, of of a technique that will help you um, go further in the questions that you're asking? Have you thought of what 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 would you like to 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 have to to further probe this unconscious majority? I guess that's a kind of a, a tricky question. So, um, yeah. I'll throw out one idea. I would love to see microfluidics in a way that wasn't um, used just for uh, isolation, because I think there are some microbes that aren't going to grow in isolation. They need their, their friends. So if you had a couple of cells in there or clusters of cells, and then not rely on their ability to replicate, but measure actually the, the input and output of certain metabolites within that individual droplet. Maybe that exists, um, not that I know of right now. So that would be very uh, exciting to me. It's funny you say that because the, the second half of what you were talking about was sort of on, on my wish list. You know, if there's a way to actually sort of see the... Um, metabolic communication like uh, between cells and in like a, a small defined community. I think the first part, the closest that I can think of is, you know, people can um, sort of deposit bacteria sort of just on surfaces like, um, and you can do, use even just wells and things like that and kind of take advantage of, of sort of random mixing, but then enumerating who is in each of those gets, gets kind of tricky. So I, yeah, I guess there isn't quite a way yet to do that at scale. I mean, the other thing too that I'll just mention that um, I, I would wish for and, and that I, I guess to just sort of talk about a limitation of fluidics is that um, it's easy to, it, you can be very high throughput in the number of bacteria that you can encapsulate or maybe even grow. What's much more tedious is um, iterating through many different experimental conditions. And that is, is, often, at least in our hands, hard to um, do in a high throughput fashion. So in other words, we can screen, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of taxa for how they grow in a particular condition. But what would be really interesting, and, and I wish we had better ways for us to take one taxa and then tax on and screen through like a thousand conditions very quickly and see where it, where it optimally grows. Manuel, any thoughts? I was still on the um, this wish list of this nice microfluidic chamber where you can observe live <laughs> metabolite exchange. And uh, we, we were thinking about that and kind of always stop when we thought, okay, we have a snapshot. If we use a mass spectrometer to, um, if we cannot subsample, then we destroy this situation. And um, then kind of, yeah, kind of that's where we, where we are at the moment. We are kind of also need to think about the amount of compound which will be exuded or exchanged by a few cells. And I think that's really stretching the limitations of, of modern mass spectrometry, but yeah, they develop pretty pretty fast. So I think um, there's kind of something on the horizon to, to be able to test soon. Some, something, something for you, Manuel. Um, when, you, when you couple um mass spectrometry imaging with with fish do you do that on um subsequent sections or on the same section and you you do one method after the other so we did it on the very same tissue section so one section is at the moment 10 micrometer thick and that's kind of is playing the host host cells which are filled with uh, symbionts they are around one micrometer to three micrometer so if we change from one section to the other to do both methods kind of after each other, um, then we are directly in a different host cell and maybe have a different phenotype. That's why we decided to develop it on the very same um, tissue section and bacterial cells. So we are shooting away when we kind of use MALDI. So we use a laser to shoot on the tissue. So there are, we ablate something, 
but there's still a lot of uh, cell material there which we can where we can do um, fish afterwards so that is that is working good awesome and and i and i guess for you and um doing a similar approach but in reverse order is not possible doing doing the nano sims first and then the fish will destroy completely the samples right so in our case, often the cells are completely gone by the time we do our nanosims analysis. Um, I, if we were analyzing much bigger cells, maybe eukaryotic cells, there would be an opportunity for that. But the tiny bacterial and archaeal cells, they don't survive <laughs> physically. Yeah, they're sure. gone. Yeah. For sure. Maybe one comment to that. We often wish to have fish before because Anna knows where the cells are so she can direct her nanosims directly to those specific cells. And we sometimes need to screen bigger areas to find the important um, areas or cells to, to look at. So for sure, for sure. it's still not possible for us. Mm -hmm. and, and based on, on your, your, your three talks, do you think that uh, with these spatial approaches and, and methods that you presented today, do you think that sequencing is, is slowly becoming obsolete in, for community analysis? I think that it's really important to integrate these methods. Like I said, many nanosim studies are, are based on hypotheses that come out of metagenomics. So I, I think the integration is where we get the most. Yeah, and I'll say too, and I, I probably could have explained this more in our talk, that part of the way that we read through um, all of these droplets is via sequencing. And because that is a technology that has already scaled so much. And so I think that it, it's at least still very useful for us. Yeah. Um, can I, I was I was um, in your in your talk and you, you told us in the first example you showed about the proportion of of fixed carbon and and that, that each of the members of, of your communities are uptaking from the diatom. So the fungi is taking uh, a bit, the, the bacteria are taking, um, taking another chunk. How did you quantify that? How, was, it, was it a time series? Uh, how did you manage to get these such, such accurate numbers in, into this, this uptake rate? So the numbers I reported was the percentage of carbon for the given type of cell that was derived from the diatom. And so since those other cells are not directly photosynthetics themselves, we could assume that any 13C that was ended up in their biomass had been fixed by the diatom since it was only provided as bicarbonate. So by looking at the isotopic composition of those cells, if it was... Um, uh, by by looking at the isotopic enrichment of the cell, essentially we can back calculate the percentage of carbon that had come from the diatom. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, something something I I noticed and link data from derived from images is that they are they are quite large and and can be computationally challenging to to process. So. Um, are the computational systems scaling to to handle this this type of data? Do you, do you face any any troubles at um, handling handling such um, large data sets at high throughput? Sorry, was that the question for me? Uh, to both of you, I guess, because because you're both dealing with large amount of of imaging data. So, um, so yeah, do, do you face issues because, because of the, uh, because of the load and, and uh, the software you're using to analyze them high throughput? I think we are okay in terms of handling the data. So have, we have software and we can op also open access software to, to handle the, the MSI data. It's more kind of the the data itself, the metabolite data, how we have issues to identify compounds, to compare images, and kind of, I would want to say the tools are missing to, to really kind of dig through the, through the data. So we only scratch on the surface. We look at a few compounds and um, few distributions, but there's, I'm pretty sure there's more behind 
behind all the data we we collect. So because we have these multi channels in principle where, where we, which we can read out. So I think there's one limitation. Thanks, thanks. Um, we have five more minutes in this panel discussion before we migrate to the breakout rooms. Um, if you have any specific questions, post them in the in the chat. One that was just posted to Lawrence was um, about cross-linking of cells. Is that possible to try and isolate bacteria that live together and um, like they used to do with proteins a long time ago? Can you comment on that, Lawrence? Yeah, I was just typing in the a response. Um, Sorry. Thanks for making it easier. So I suspect there are uh, chemical ways to tighten uh, links between cells. And um, one thing though, is that many of the cells already come sort of in bunches. And so what we actually have to agitate before we do um, the fluidics uh, normally to, in order to get them to be isolated. So actually it's, it's a really neat idea um, to basically skip that step and then see what kinds of clumps of bacteria actually would grow together. And then maybe this gets at what Anne was talking about before too, of, of looking at smaller consortia. Thanks, thanks. Um, a question for Manuel in the, the chat as well. Um, Jason asked if it would be possible to see if host cells exhibit metabolic heterogeneity as a function of metabolic heterogeneity in the micro in the microbes. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty <laughs> interesting question, and, and I think we have some data which is uh, which is showing that. So. One issue which we have there is we have to look at metabolites which are specific for the host. So central metabolites like glycolysis or TCA, which also our microbes do, I think that will be difficult to distinguish. But um, what works well are lipids, host lipids, which, um, which we see are changing depending on um, the presence of symbionts or not. We haven't gone in that detail that we kind of have a phenotype of one symbiont um, strain and how this is influencing host uh, the host phenotype. So this is really fine scale and I wish I would kind of can zoom more into it on, on a few single cells and really know what's going on. But that's definitely possible to, to, see, to see a difference on, on a broader scale. Another, another question for you, Manuel, from Pam, who is asking how viable the spatial metabolomes are over time. And if you expect to see differences in the spatial location of metabolites over, for example, seasons, environmental variables, or do you expect it to be rather stable spatially? Um, I think from the deep sea, what I presented is very, very weird example because we have to get the samples to, to the surface and then cryofix them. But we have a, a project where we work on seagrass roots, and there we can see a, um, a different effect over day and night. So there is a distribution difference of compounds within tissues. And I think that's um, also shown by bulk analysis. Now we can look into um, different tissues, different organs, and get a clearer picture. One issue we have, we have to kind of kill, <laughs> kill the organism to get that one snapshot and then go on for, for another replicate and, and do that. And that's where we need high throughput. That's one limitation at the moment that we have to measure many replicates to kind of really make those um, kind of or look at the data. Thanks, thanks. Uh, there's, a, there's a good question in the chat from Maurizio uh, who asked both Anne and Manuel, um, now that the resolution and spatial distribution at the, sing at the single cell seems to be good, how do you see primary versus secondary metabolite studies based on temporal distribution in situ? Uh, because primary metabolite, metabolism might occur faster than secondary metabolism. Um, and um, yeah, do you, do you think it's um, this type of in-situ um, studies can be, can be performed or um, If I understand the question correctly, um, this question is about whether we can see the 
the flow of um, kind of elements through an ecosystem over time. So you'd have a primary consumer of a substrate and then cross feeding so that a secondary consumer would eat the product of the first one. If that's in fact what the, the question is, I think um, this is a really neat thing that we can look at um, with single cells now. And it's, it's really dif difficult to differentiate a primary versus a secondary metabolism based on the amount of label that we see incorporated because this could just depend on variable rates of activity. But what we've been doing in my group to try to differentiate that is to use a second isotope label, like an overall indicator of activity. So if, for instance, we know the rates of activity based on their 15N uptake from ammonium or their um, uptake of deuterium from D2O, then we can say what percentage of their carbon has come from the carbon source and then try to get at the primary versus secondary that way. You can also take samples through time as maybe this person is suggesting. But yeah, I think that's a really neat direction for this kind of work. Thanks, thanks. We're going to stop our panel discussion now and go into the breakup rooms. You should receive um, a link directly in the chat. So um, follow the, the link to the person you want to, to be speaking with and it's to the first 30 people um, registering. So I'll, I'll see you in the breakup rooms in, in, in a bit. Thanks everyone for joining in. Thanks a lot.